inviting me and giving me the opportunity, Pastor Austin as well. Uh, it's great to, to be able to share God's Word with God's people. And uh, again, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's my first time, I believe, preaching here in the Cleveland Church. And uh, I was looking forward to it. And I pray that as we share together and as we spend a little bit of time going through the scriptures, that you and I would be able to come out blessed uh, as we go back home. What I'd like to talk to you today about, and as you have seen the title of the, of the message, I'd like to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. But I'd like to talk to you about the Holy Spirit because, not just because we need to continue hammering on the person, the nature of the Holy Spirit. We already went through that about a few months ago when we were doing a quarterly on the Holy Spirit. And I was really blessed and I was really excited about reading through it and uh, seeing the different aspects that were being presented about the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure you enjoyed it as well. But there was one thing that I noticed was not covered in that quarterly and that motivated me to do a little additional study. And that was looking into the different symbols that are used in the scriptures to present or to describe the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and I'd like to share with you today some of those symbols. Sometimes, as we look at the scriptures, we will find that the Holy Spirit is quite an, quite an enigmatic person within the deity. We can read a lot about the Father in the scriptures. Definitely, we got the entire New Testament to know about the Son, though he's also mentioned in the, New, in the Old Testament. But when you look at the scriptures and you try to read about and understand about the Holy Spirit, it becomes a little bit more challenging, to say the least, because we don't have a systematic way of describing the Holy Spirit within the scriptures. Yet, I'd like to submit to you today, the Holy Spirit is a very important person within the divinity. And it's not only a very important person, but his ministry is very significant within the whole plan of redemption. And when we do not understand the Holy Spirit, then that whole plan of redemption can also be misunderstood at times. And when we look at the symbols of the Holy Spirit, sometimes those symbols have led individuals to perceive the Holy Spirit as something else rather than what it is presented in the scriptures. So let me take a few moments and share with you a little bit of my findings as I was looking into the symbols of the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to begin by presenting to you a couple of elements before we go into those symbols of the Holy Spirit. And if you go to the scriptures with me and you turn your Bibles with me, there are a couple of places that I'd like you to consider as we will be beginning this message. The Holy Spirit, I mentioned to you, is quite a significant person within the scriptures and within the divinity. Because when you look at the scriptures, you're going to find that the very first person of the divinity that is mentioned in the scriptures is precisely the Holy Spirit. And when you go through the scriptures and then to the end of the Bible, you're going to find that the Holy Spirit is one of the very last ones to be mentioned in the scriptures. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, 
the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. And if you read verses 1 and 2, which was our scripture reading. And I want to thank um, also Gianna for reading it. She did a wonderful job uh, reading that biblical passage for us. I really appreciated it so much. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Notice how the Bible, uh, the author of the, of, of the book of Genesis, began the scriptures. He just, he just didn't begin by explaining God. He just was not trying to somehow reason about God. In Genesis 1-1, the author of the book, Moses, began with a very bold statement. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You all know, you all, you all know that text, right? Great. Now, let me teach you something about that text. That perhaps you have already learned it. And if you do, let's refresh it a little bit. If you don't, then let's learn, let's learn it here. Okay? When Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, what is this God referring to? Okay? Now, this is the beginning, and this is why I say this is a very significant, bold statement on the part of Moses. Because the term God, as it appears there in Genesis 1-1, though it appears as a singular term, when you look at the original from which it is translated from in the Hebrew, it is the word Elohim. Have you heard that, that word, Elohim? How many of you have heard that word before? Plenty of you. Excellent. So I am talking to people who are acquainted with it. Excellent. Now, what is so particular about the term Elohim? For many, Elohim is just simply a name of God, which in reality, yes, it is used as a name, but it's not only used as a name. Okay? It is an actual word that when you understand it, you break it apart, you're going to find something interesting. The term Elohim ending I am, I am is the plural form that the Hebrews used to describe more than one thing. Okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at. So E-L means God. I am means plurality. So when Moses is writing, in the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What Moses is doing, what Moses is saying is, in the beginning, the plurality of the divinity made possible the heavens and the earth, which indicates more than one person was involved in the creation of the world. Are you following me, church? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is why when you go to Genesis 1.26, you're, you're not going to read there that only one person was active in the creation or the making of man. In Genesis 1.26, you read, let what? Let us make man in what? Our image. According to what? Our likeness. This is not a plurality of royalty as some people have claimed it. The Hebrew is very clear. When the Hebrew says new, us, it means more than one. It means us. Plurality. Are you following? Now, as we understand that, we will see now that the first person that now is mentioned individually is the Holy Spirit. And that's where you come in, in verse 2, where it says, The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. 
And then the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Don't lose sight of that. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it as we were going to be looking into one of those symbols of the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that. Okay? So now, first of all, as we can see, from the very beginning, Moses has made an effort to get us acquainted with the divinity in a plural form. But then, as you continue looking a little bit more, you're going to find that that deity, those three members of the deity, do have a body form. We normally think of the Father as having a body. Obviously, we think of Jesus as having a body. But when we, when we think of the Spirit, what comes to our minds? What comes to our minds is what we have inherited from our Greek friends back in the first century AD, and that is spirit is a bodyless thing. Isn't that what we think? Because we have been influenced by that Greek thinking. However, so that Moses helps us begin to see that this concept is not the biblical one, because Hebrews didn't think that way, Moses now not only helps us to see that in the beginning, all three members of the deity were involved, but also all three members have a basic form. We don't know what that looked like, we have never seen it. We only see some descriptions in the Bible. But so that you and I have an idea. When Genesis 1.26. When you read there in Genesis 1.26. And you read that God is saying. Let us make man in our image. May I ask. Who's involved. In the us. Who's involved. In the our. Is it only the, the father. Is it the father. And the son. Or is it the father. The Son and the Holy Spirit. Who's involved there? All three are involved. And so God is saying, let us make man in our image. And when you take the term image in the scriptures and you trace it throughout the, uh, the, the Old Testament, you're going to find that that image, that term refers to a physical representation of something. Which indicates then that the Father has an image, a physical representation, a physical body. The Son has an image, a physical representation, a physical body. The Holy Spirit has a physical representation, has an image, has a physical body. Are you following? Is this clear? Maybe the latter one might have been a little different than the thinking of some of you. But continue reading. Our image, and if all three are involved, then all three will have an image. Our likeness, and if all three are involved, then all three have a likeness. Are you all with me? Great. So now, why is it then that the Holy Spirit is presented through a wind, for example, or a dove, some fire, or even running waters, oil, olive oil. 
You, have read, you all have read those passages, right? So then why the Holy Spirit is being presented or described that way? For some individuals, the conclusion has been that if the Holy Spirit is described as a wind, then the Holy Spirit is just a wind or a force or some, some other type of influence. Some others have come to a conclusion, or oh, maybe the Holy Spirit, it's just a fire. But why the symbols? So what I'd like to do today, I'd like to share with you some thoughts concerning two, possibly three of those symbols. We will not be dwelling in all of them. As time we will, not, will not allow us. But at least so that not only we can get an idea, but at the same time, maybe awake your appetite, your biblical appetite. You may go into the scriptures and, do, and then continue doing a little bit of additional search to find out a little bit more. So let's look at the first one. Let's look at the first one. The Holy Spirit is compared to a soft wind. The term spirit, as we find it in the scriptures, could be translated as wind, could be translated as breath, or breathing. But it can also be translated as spirit, I mean, I'm sorry, as angel or Holy Spirit. Where, you, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? Here's a little principle that you need to ask yourself each time you're reading the Bible and you come across that term spirit. When you see that word, spirit, in the scriptures, ask yourself this question. Is the term spirit being used in connection with something of the earth? And if so, then most likely talking about a wind or talking about breathing or breath. If the context is being talked about heaven, then most likely your translation will be a reference to an angel or to the Holy Spirit. That's where you begin to draw the line. So now, let's look at a wind, a soft wind. Why the Holy Spirit is described that way? Your reference, you'll find it there in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19. 1 Kings, chapter 19. I'll give you just a brief background so you get an idea. Elijah has done one of the greatest accomplishments in the story of Israel at this time. If you read chapter 16 of 1 Kings, you're going to find a description of who Ahab was as a king. Not only the, the Bible says that Ahab had done so many evil things, but then towards the end of chapter 16, you're going to find that there is a general conclusion about King Ahab, who was and who has done worse than any previous king before him. So this is a time when Israel is at its lowest spiritually. So much <clears throat> that Israel was confused concerning who to worship. And it was confused because Israel was being brought together thinking of God, Yahweh, the true God, but with the marriage of 
King Ahab and Jezebel, now there is an introduction of another god, and that was Baal. And so that created confusion among the Israelites. It is not as simple as you think. It might have been back in those days to say, no to, ya- to Baal, yes to Yahweh. It's not as simple. Today we may see it that way. It is not as simple. And I tell you why it is not as simple. The faith of Yahweh and the faith of Baal has some similarities. Very close similarities. To the point that the Israelites' vision was blurred. And they couldn't really see what's wrong with Baal. Why? The faith in Yahweh required sacrifice. The faith in Baal also required sacrifice. So far, same. The faith in Yahweh required blood. The faith in Baal also required blood. So far, the same. And people are wondering, what's wrong with Baal? Both sacrifice, sacrifice, both blood. So what's wrong? Here's the other thing. Yahweh is also Lord. That's how he's called in Old Testament times. You know what's the meaning of the term Baal? Baal means Lord. So you will read in the Old Testament that sometimes God is called Baal because he is Lord. Are you following? So all this time, people are wondering, they're they're so similar, what's wrong? And here's the difference between Yahweh and Baal. The only difference was the source of the sacrifice and the source of the blood. That was the only difference between those two. For Baal, the source of the sacrifice was the human being. And this is why they sacrificed babies to the Canaanite gods. The source of the blood was also human. And this is why at Mount Carmel, you will notice that the prophets of Baal, what were they doing while jumping up and down at Mount Carmel? They were cutting themselves. Why? Because as blood will be pouring out of their bodies, Baal will listen to them, and then fire will come down. Are you understanding? For God, Yahweh, what was the source of the sacrifice? What was the source of the blood? It was God himself. He was the one coming down to die, shed his blood for you and for me. Symbolized through the lamb, yes. But God was the, was the source. And this is why Elijah told Israel on Mount Carmel, until when you are faltering between two thoughts. If God, if Yahweh is Lord, follow him. If Baal, go after him. Are you understanding so far? So it is in that midst of that confusion that now Elijah comes in. And then on Mount Carmel, then he finally creates clarity, brings God into perspective. People are revived. People's eyes are opened to the true reality of the true God. And this is why people confess when they saw fire coming down, Yahweh, the Lord, He is God. Okay? And it is in, that, in the midst of that great accomplishment that now Elijah hears the threats of Jezebel. How she promises that she's going to deal with Elijah the same way that he did with the prophets of Baal. And so Elijah then took off. He ran away 
to hide somewhere. And it is in that hiding place that now God found him. And that's what you find in chapter 19. And then, in chapter 19, beginning in verse 11, God is asking Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And, beho and, be and behold, the Lord passed by. And then a great and a strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, put the Lord uh, but the Lord was not in the wind, a strong wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God was not in the fire. When is it that now finally Elijah is able to recognize the presence of the Lord? You read there at the end of verse 12, and this is the, uh, I'm, I'm reading from the, from the New King James. And after the fire, a still small voice. The term voice can also be translated as sound, as it is clearly brought up in the comments on this Andrews University annotated Bible. So the soft wind created a still sound or voice that helped Elijah recognize the presence of the Lord. And who was behind that still voice, still sound, or that soft wind. You want to see in chapter 19, verse 18, God is not only letting Elijah know that his life was so agitated by the threats of Jezebel. He needed it to rest in God. Because if you read before, all this time Elijah is thinking, I'm the only one left. All the other prophets have been killed. And then in verse 18, is where God is assuring Elijah, you are not alone. Because I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that, have, that has not kissed him. And so Elijah understood then that at that moment, he needed the presence of the Lord. To bring peace, to bring tranquility into his life. But there's one more thing where you can see the Holy Spirit involved in terms of a wind or a breath. This very same concept is taken back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, you're going to find that after God had made man, he had fashioned the whole body of man and all the members and everything was included, man was still lifeless until God acted something to give life to man. What is it that God did? He breathed the breath of life. And then man became what? A living soul. Modern translations will read modern person. I mean, living person. 
The term breathing, breath, again, is the same one for spirit. So the spirit not only brings tranquility, spirit brings life. You can see it also that verified in Ezekiel chapter 20, um, is it, no, 36, I believe. Let me just double check my notes here. Um, that is in Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm sorry, 37, verses 1 through 14, with the vision of the value of bones. It is through that wind and that breathing that the, that the bones became human bodies again. So why is it that the spirit is represented through a soft, through a still, sound, wind? Because the spirit is that person, is that divine person who can bring peace to your life in the midst of challenges in the midst of trials, issues that you might be facing. He is that divine person who can also revive your soul, give you the life that you need to carry on the things that you need to do. Here's the second symbol that I'd like to share with you. The second symbol is the dove. In that one, you'll find it in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You might recall the passage. Let me just give you a brief depiction of it. Jesus has come down to the Jordan River. He has been dipped into the waters. And then after he's been baptized by John, Jesus come up out of the waters. And when he does that, then the Holy Spirit comes down to Jesus or on Jesus in the form of a dove. And then a voice is heard from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The question is, why did the Spirit come down on Jesus in the form of a dove? Why a dove? A couple of things that I'd like to mention to you this morning. Amen. In the book of Leviticus... Chapter 12, verse 6, and I'm going to give you only the references. We're not going to read them. In the book of Genesis 15, verse 9. So Genesis 15, 9, Leviticus 12, 6. A dove is a sacrificial animal. It was used in the sanctuary for sacrifices. Coming down on Jesus, who was to be the Lamb of, the, of, of God, who will take away the sin of the world... Now, Jesus is being assured that in this process of the sacrifice, he's not going to be alone. The Spirit will be with him. At the same time, when you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, you will see Jesus' description that the Holy Spirit, that the disciples need to be meek or need to be simple as a dove. The same description of Jesus' personality or character trait. Jesus was a meek person ministering on your behalf and on my behalf. But see, those two characteristics will help you begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit and why it's symbolized as a dove. But then, here's the thing. The first time in the scriptures that the term dove appears 
Can you remember where? Yes. Genesis chapter 8. Correct. You remember the story? And I'm just going to be giving you background um, explanation. The ark was floating on the waters in the midst of the big ocean. Earth was totally covered. And then Noah opened up that little window and he took a raven. He was now testing whether it was time to come out or not, whether the waters had already um, um, gone down or not. And so the raven went out. But as you read Genesis 8, the raven came back rejoicing. Is that correct? You're not saying anything. Am I speaking heresy here? Come on, church. The raven didn't return. Something happened to the, uh, to the bird. It just didn't return. Maybe it got lost. Who knows what? Then Noah took a dove, opened up his little window again, and he let the dove go to check out whether the waters have come down or not. And after flying a little bit around, the dove found its way back to the ark. Seems like it has a sense of orientation, right? And Noah understood it's not time yet. Seven days later, he picked up the same animal, opened up the little window, released the animal. The animal was flying around. But this time, when the dove returned, what is it that he brought with him? Ah, oh, he picked up a little branch of an olive tree. And so with that, Noah already understood waters are down. Is it time to go out? No. Because you know that even though when you don't see waters above, you know that it gets muddy and you need to let the ground dry before you can do something. And so he let seven days later go pass by. He took the animal, released them, and then the animal never returned and Noah understood it's time to get out and so he did now notice how this dove basically provided the guidance to Noah to understand when it was time to stay in the ark or when it was time to get out of the ark an animal with a sense of orientation. Now, that happened while the ark was still surrounded by water. Now, take that image and read it throughout the scriptures. Go back to Genesis 1-2. Remember that I mentioned, don't lose sight of it. Go back to Genesis 1-2. Just as the dove was hovering over the waters of the flood, what was the Holy Spirit doing in Genesis 1, 2? It was also hovering over the face or the surface of the waters. And he was present all the time until creation was completed. Just as the dove was present all the time until it was time to go and that was it. When you go back to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, you will find that when the Spirit comes on Jesus, where is Jesus standing? He is in the middle of the Jordan River, in the middle of the waters. And that's when the Spirit comes in. 
and the Spirit does not leave Jesus until his ministry on earth is completed and Jesus ascended to heaven. And when he ascended up to heaven, now the Spirit comes to stay with the church. So, is the Spirit a dove? No. But the symbol of a dove is provided there so that the people understand, you and I understand, that the Holy Spirit is ready and will be with us, providing orientation to our spiritual lives, providing guidance to our lives. And the Holy Spirit will remain with us until redemption is completed and we're ready to go home. Amen. Are you following? Let me just finish with this. And this is the last symbol that i like to mention. Fire. The time when we see the Holy Spirit, or the event when we see the Holy Spirit being described as a fire, or illustrated through a fire, is found in the book of Acts, chapter 2. In Acts, chapter 2. Normally, you will see fire used in the Bible in two main areas. One is destruction, purifying, and the other is to present God's glory. Those are the two main areas where you see fire being used in the scriptures. Notice how that is also portrayed throughout the scriptures. If you read Leviticus chapter 9, and I'm going to give you only the reference. I'm going to cite to you the event, give you the reference for you to go back and continue reading a little bit more. In Leviticus 9 verses 23 and 24, as the sanctuary is being inaugurated by Moses, and now Aaron and his sons are being inaugurated as priests in Israel. When you read Genesis, I mean Leviticus 9, you're going to find that what marked or characterized that inauguration and that approval of God was fire coming down from heaven on the altar. And when people saw that fire... People praised God and people recognized the priesthood of Aaron and his children. The other event, we, I, I, I already make reference to it, 1 Kings 18, when Elijah's ministry was validated before King Ahab and before the prophets of Baal and before Israel. When fire came down from heaven to the altar, it consumed the victim. It took all the water and even the, 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 the rocks that were used to build the altar. And all Israel then praised God, glorify God, for he is the true God. Then when you come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, you will read, and I'll be reading just a little bit from it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, you will read that the disciples, not only the twelve, but all the other disciples, had come together. On the day of Pentecost. And the scripture says in verse 1. That they were all with one accord. In that upper room. And as they were in that. Upper room in one accord. Confessing their sins to one another. And, and excusing, apologizing, whatever they were doing. They were reuniting themselves as a one body, as a group of one body of disciples. 
Verse 2 says that suddenly there came a sound from heaven. And here's the combination now. As of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared, verse 3, to them, divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Have you ever wondered? And actually, this is the first time and only time that you read in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is compared to fire. Have you ever wondered why the Holy Spirit came down on each one of the disciples in the form of a tongue of fire? Why not as a dove? Why not as a soft wind? Why not as a rushing water? Or oil. Why on this specific event. The Holy Spirit. Came down. In the likeness of. Fire. What's going on. In Acts 2. Yes. It's the day of Pentecost. Big celebration. In the days of. The disciples. Within the Jewish people. But why fire? What's going on at that time? Here's the thing. Jesus had already ascended up to heaven. Okay? And according to the biblical record, not only Jesus had ascended up to heaven, but Jesus ascended to sit on the right-hand side of the Father on his father's throne. Have you seen all those passages? So. After Jesus ascended up to heaven. 40 days later. Now the Holy Spirit comes down. And Jesus had promised. That he was going to be sending the comforter. To his disciples. But the Holy Spirit could have come in many other forms. He chose fire this time. And I tell you why. He chose fire. Because. Jesus was beginning. A ministry. Up in heaven. Remember. Hebrews. Chapter 4. Verses 14 through 16. We have such a high priest in heaven. Let us come bold before the throne of grace. And so many other passages. What was the sign. That the church needed. In order to understand. That Jesus priestly ministry. Had begun in heaven. Jesus didn't tell them. At least we don't read it in the Gospels. That 40 days later. After he had ascended. He was going to be beginning his priestly ministry. Because all this time for centuries. Jesus priestly ministry was being symbolized. By the work of the high priest. In the sanctuary and in the temple. But when is it that now Jesus. Will then begin his ministry. So, so, so that the earthly ministry will then. Be done with, and Jesus will begin the heavenly one. This is why the Lord chose fire to come on the disciples. And this is why when you begin reading from Acts 2 onward, now the disciples not only are preaching about Jesus, preaching about salvation, and also making miracles, but when you read the, the, uh, the, the writings of Paul and the other disciples, they all talk about what Jesus is doing up in heaven. 
And so that it will be clear in the minds of the disciples. Fire came down from heaven in Leviticus 9 to signify the inauguration of Aaron as high priest. God used the same image in Acts 2. Fire came down from heaven to signify the beginning of Jesus. High priestly ministry in heaven for you and for me. Is this clear, church? So it's not like the Holy Spirit is fire. It's only used so that we can make the connection and we don't get lost as we read the scriptures. And so as the Holy Spirit not only helps us understand what Jesus is doing, the, the Holy Spirit is also working in our lives to help us get closer to, to Jesus and be able then to put our lives in harmony with his principles. No wonder the book of Revelation closes in chapter 22 telling us, and the Spirit and the bride says, come, come, Lord Jesus. Let me conclude with this remark. I don't know where you stand concerning the person of the Holy Spirit. But wherever you stand, I can see clearly a divine person working to bring peace to my life, to bring guidance, orientation to my life, and to lead my attention to our true high priest in heaven. Would you like the Holy Spirit to continue working, providing that guidance, that direction in your lives? Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord continue guiding you. And may the Lord help us be ready to go home. Amen. God bless you. Mm. For our closing song, let's turn in our hymnals to number 326. 326, open mine eyes that I may see. Thank you. 